I certainly appreciate men like Lester. As I mentioned earlier, and I wasn't joking, it's certainly been uh, him and many men like him have been an influence on my life as I watch men who are willing to take a stand for the truth and to uh, make that stand no matter persecution that might come. And uh, he certainly suffered some of that, as many men that I'm uh, faithful men do. So, uh, Brother Lester, come and feature us. <coughs> I'm certainly grateful to be able to stand before you this morning and to speak on this lectureship. I have enjoyed and appreciated fellowship with this congregation for many years, uh, back to the time of the College of the Bible and my participation on the faculty of that school and my time in Baytown, Texas, when I was preaching there. I have long appreciated uh, the eldership of this congregation and the preacher of this congregation and I appreciate the opportunity to be again in personal fellowship with you this week. I will not uh, express as I did last year the difference in the numbers of people in the audience today as opposed to when I'm back home. But let me just say that uh, I am privileged to stand before a few more people this morning than I normally do. Uh, Brother Ken mentioned earlier that uh, the eldership here is hated and Brother Brown is hated. And I'm sure I'm hated by some. And I expect to be because the Lord said if they hated me, they'll hate you. And as long as I stand for the truth and do those things that my Lord wants me to do, I'm sure there will be many people who will be opposed to me and hate me. But I am also uh, convinced that as long as I do those things that the Lord asked me to do, that there will be brethren who love me and appreciate me. And the most important thing is that I will be pleasing to the Lord. And that's the reason that I do what I do and will continue to do what I do. Amen. I want to begin this morning in consideration of this book that I have been asked to review, Theology Simplified, God, His Son, and His Spirit, by Lonzo Pribble. By reading a passage of scripture that I think is appropriate to this review, and probably to all of the reviews that you will hear this week, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. Not always do men creep in privily to teach damnable heresies. Sometimes they publish books. But many are influenced by these books, and the truth becomes evil spoken of because of these books. And most of the time, the motivation behind these books is covetousness. I don't know personally Lonzo Pribble, though he lives in the same city that I live in. But I know that it to be the case that this book is full of error full of deceitful lies of Satan. It is my prayer that these studies this week will alert the unsuspecting and enlighten the honest and good hearts so that true, the true character of these errors will be exposed and the truth of God's word will be accepted, believed, and obeyed. 
It breaks my heart to see the precious body of Christ ravaged by those who claim to be friends of the truth. It grieves me deeply to realize that souls are going to be lost because of the effort of some of these supposed brethren who write these books, which will be discussed this week. The book that I review this morning is a book that was copyrighted in, the, in 2001 and originally and for many years published by Alvin Jennings and the Star Bible Publications Incorporated. More recently, I don't know whether it was financial or some other motivation, but uh, Star no longer publishes the book and it is privately published since August the 18th of 2009. The subtitle of the book reveals the real purpose and objective of the book. The subtitle is, Why the Doctrine of the Trinity is Neither Reasonable Nor Biblical. Lonzo Pribble indicates in his introduction that the research for this book took place over a period of some 45 years since he has not published a retraction or a refinement of these doctrines since that time. I suppose he is still studying the subject and now for some 55 years. He says that uh, the, for the first 30 years of this period, he gave no thought to ever publishing a book on the subject. It's my opinion that it would have been, we had been far better off had he never given consideration to publishing it and certainly never publishing it. This is the only book that Pribble has ever written and unfortunately this book is the only thing that most people will know about this man. Pribble suggests that the idea for the title of this book came from a quotation of Barton W. Stone in an address to the churches regarding his rejection of the doctrine of the Trinity. Stone wrote, others who have labored through many volumes of scholastic learning on this doctrine may be disposed to object to my view of it because of its simplicity. They have long taught that the doctrine was a high, incomprehensible mystery. We are told by some that it is an evidence of an humble art to believe it. Pribble takes what he says, and I quote, Stone's simple, understandable point of view expands and elaborates on it and shows how that the resulting point of view more than any other withstands the scrutiny of divine scripture. His reference and use to Stone as the basis for his book, no doubt intended, was intended to give evidence to or credence to his point of view. But I will not uh, justify any belief on what another man teaches. I will not follow Stone or Campbell or any other man. These men had many things right, according to the scriptures, but they still had some things wrong. I certainly respect the early restorers and what they did, but I am not a disciple of Stone, nor am I a disciple of Campbell. Give me the Bible. Pribble states that he presents this book, God, His Son, and His Spirit, in clear, understandable language with a concept so biblical and so simple that even a layman, the novice, and in most cases even children can understand. But I'm reminded that sometimes things easily understood are not necessarily the truth. Consider, for example, the problems with the translation known as the easy-to-read version of the New Testament published by some so-called brethren a number of years ago. Just because something is easily understood does not mean that it is true. Sometimes simplifying a message changes the message. Theology simplified is divided into three major sections. Part one bears the title God and his son, 
and contains some 45 chapters totaling 197 pages of a 308-page book. It is not possible, certainly, to consider all of what Pribble has written, but I will attempt to fairly present some of the views that are presented in this book and focus on a few of them that uh, suggest his doctrine of God and show the fallacies of his doctrine. Before we get into the details of his doctrine, I want to tell you that he begins by giving what he refers to himself as the Preblobian Creed, consisting of three tenets which uh, set forth his view of God, his Son, and his Spirit. I want to use his word so that you know exactly what he's saying. The first tenet of his creed is this, and I quote, I believe in the one and only true God, the Father in heaven, known to Israel as Jehovah, the I am, the existing one, the almighty one, that supreme spirit being, person and substance who is eternal, without beginning or end, unborn, uncreated, self-existent, omnipotent, om omnipresent, omniscient, immutable, and infinite, who is the independent of, unlimited by, and superior to all other beings, the creator of whom are all things, and sovereign of the universe, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of our spirits, and in whom we live, and move and have our very being. I think most of us, as having never read his book, uh, would uh, readily agree with uh, what he has stated here. But what he does here in this statement is employ some terminology and some unique significance to some of these terms. He uses the phrase, for example, one and only true God with reference only to the Father and in contrast to Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As, we, as it will become obvious as we progress, Pribble does not consider the Son or the Holy Spirit to be God. Also note God, exclusively, exclusively the Father, according to his view, is, according to him, independent of, unlimited by, and superior to all other beings. According to Pribble, the Son would be included in his reference to all other beings and is therefore inferior to the Father. We will soon understand, as we continue to study this book, that he does not even consider the Holy Spirit to be a being. In fact, Pribble prefers the pronoun it and not he in reference to the Holy Spirit. Later, he says in the book on page 199, and I quote, and just as I have a spirit which is not a separate person from myself, as my son is a separate person, but is rather an essential and composite part of the person I am. Jehovah God likewise has a spirit which is not a separate person, and he capitalizes every letter in the word not, which is not a separate person from the Father, as Christ is a separate person from the Father, but is rather an essential and composite part of the Father, which the Father is. It also should be noted in the first tenet of his creed that he references the Father as the I Am. Bear in mind that Jesus uses that same exact expression in John 8, verse 58, regarding himself. Pribble engages in some fanciful reasoning on this passage later in this same volume. And we'll discuss this later as well as we have time. But he says here, he that is Jesus was saying in John 8 verse 58, 
that his birth in Bethlehem was not the beginning of his personal existence. Before Abraham came into being, Christ already existed. By saying, I am, instead of I was, Jesus removed any speculation that he might have existed at some point before Abraham, and then existed again as a result of the birth of Mary. I am meant that Jesus' existence, spanning all the way from Abraham to this present life as a human being, and that's all that that expression here means. I am, listen now, this is what he's saying. I am does not prove, as some have supposed, that Jesus is Jehovah God without beginning. Just because Jehovah God had identified himself to Moses as I am who I am in Exodus chapter 3 verse 14. This is Pribble again. Such would mean, he says, that any other person who might ever say I am or I exist would be guilty of blasphemy by making himself God. Can we believe such? Consider the context of John 8 and verse 58. This context suggests that Jesus has a very purpose in mind as he makes this statement. His purpose was to prove himself to be God. He was not merely stating as you and I might, that I am in the normal sense of the term, but showing his eternality in the same way as God used the exact same terminology in his conversation with Moses in Exodus chapter 3 verse 14. Was God suggesting to Moses that he merely pre-existed Moses? I believe Pribble misses the point entirely because the point contradicts his preconceived notion of what he's trying to prove. This is characteristic of Pribble throughout his book. He looks at many scriptures but rests them all to his own destruction in an effort to make them fit into his own pet theory. As Brother Doug McClish suggested to me earlier, this is merely Pribble's dribble. Consider uh, Pribble's view of Christ as stated in his creed, and again I quote, I believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Messiah, our Lord, the only begotten divine Son of Jehovah God. Now notice this next part. Born, not created, preceded only by God and born of God alone without the aid of any other being, possessing by inheritance that same divine nature as God his Father, born before all ages, before any other being, person or thing, ever came into being, the firstborn of all creation and by whom all things were created, both in heaven and on earth who in the fullness of time and for our salvation was sanctified by God and sent forth from heaven into the world, begotten by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary, called the Lamb of God because of his atoning sacrifice and called the Word of God because he declared God's Word so completely and so authoritatively. I suggest to us this morning that Pribble's view varies very little from the Jehovah's Witness doctrine. Pribble believes, however, that the Son was born, not created, and that he was born of God without the aid of any other being. He therefore believes that Jesus is not eternal, for he, according to Pribble's theory and creed, is preceded only by God. For one to be the offspring of God without the aid of any other being therefore composed of God's very nature and substance as opposed opposed to human nature or substance, does not make that one the God he is the offspring of. Not God, this is Pribble again, not God in the absolute sense, but rather in a qualified or relative sense. So you see that according to Pribble, Jesus the Christ is not, listen, not, God in the absolute sense, but rather in a qualified or relative sense. Absurd. 
There is no, not much difference between God in a qualified or relative sense and the Jehovah's Witnesses doctrine and corrupt translation of John 1 and verse 1 where they have in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was a God, lowercase g. There is no statement in the scripture that suggests anything even close to being God in a qualified or relative sense. I'm not sure what that would mean. And I'm not sure that Pribble would not know the meaning of that terminology, except for his little hobby espoused in his doctrinally rotten book. And to think he's been studying this for some 55 years. The final and third point of his uh, creed reads, I believe the Holy Ghost, that one eternal spirit of God, the spirit of Jehovah, the spirit of the Father, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of truth, the spirit of holiness. Now listen, a part of that divine essence that makes the one God, the God that he is, and by which God is omnipresent, that which ever proceeds from the Father and in or with which the apostles were baptized on Pentecost. According to Pribble, the Holy Spirit is not a member of the Godhead, a distinct entity, but means that a means by which the, the God the Father has power and influence and works, he stated. The Holy Spirit is an influence, that is, God influences mankind in various ways by his omnipotent spirit, just as my spirit is an influence, whether bad or good, depending on whether my mind is the mind of the flesh or the mind of the spirit. But my spirit is more than an influence. It is an essential and composite part of myself, part of that which makes me the person I am. So is the Holy Spirit more than a mere influence, it is an essential and composite part of God, part of that which makes God the person he is. And every influence exhibited by the Holy Spirit is the influence of God, influenced by his omnipotent spirit. However, while this evidence shows that the Holy Spirit is the power of God, it is not claimed that the Holy Spirit is identical with the power but is the medium through which God administered his power. The Holy Spirit is far more than the power and influence of God. It is the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is not a he, but an it, according to Pribble's warp view. According to him, there is an exact parallel between man and his spirit and God and his spirit. But I remind Pribble and others, God is not flesh and blood. Matthew 16, 17, Galatians 1, verse 16. I remind Pribble and others that God is not man. Numbers 23, verse 19, in spite of all of Pribble's observations to the contrary. For example, he reasons, quote, If the witness of the Holy Spirit makes the Holy Spirit a distinct person, then likewise the witness of my spirit, makes my spirit a distinct personal entity. Then he says, in, on page 230, the Holy Spirit can be God in the sense of being divine, not human, not animal, not angelic. But the Holy Spirit is neither called God nor the God in the pages of Scripture. Reading through the book makes it obvious that... Uh, Pribble re depends very heavily upon modernists. He refers repeatedly to Barclay's daily study Bible, Barclay being a modernist. He loves the New International Version study Bible, and he makes use of a wide range of translations when those translations suit his fancy. Among them would be the NIV, the Amplified Bible, today's English version, the Simple English Bible, the New English Bible, Goodspeed's translation, and Weymouth's translation. 
And by all means, he refers also to the Jehovah's Witness translation, the New World translation. As we read through the book, we recognize that his foundation is unstable. In fact, we might refer to it as quicksand. Let's give a little time here, as time remains, to a couple of verses that he uses in reference to Jesus, which I believe to be the most blasphemous part of the book. He uses a wide range of passages uh, as he deals with these false notions that he uh, sets forth in his book. In fact, he makes the uh, mistake that uh, most liberals make, and that is that he steadily uh, whittles away at the truth and sometimes small bits and pieces, and if a person's not alert, uh, they're not going to see what he's uh, actually doing here. But let's look at John chapter 1 for a moment. John 1 verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Whatever John the Apostle meant, this is Pribble, Whatever John the Apostle meant by applying the term God to the Word, John 1 verse 1, which became flesh, verse 14, he obviously, he obviously was not declaring Christ to be ho theos, the God whom he was with. For then John proceeded to explain in verse 18, no one has ever seen God. And then John himself summarized his gospel narrative thus, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John 20, verse 30. Therefore, Pribble again. Therefore, John 1, verse 1, apparently was not written to convince anyone that Christ is God in the absolute sense. Several observations are needed from the above citation. Pribble uses the term obviously to suggest that his interpretation is the obvious one when in actuality he has missed the obvious meaning. If words have meaning, and indeed they do, John obviously declared, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It is obvious that according to the inspired John, that the situation being described is different from human experience and above human experience. Jesus, the one who ultimately came in the flesh, was both, listen, with God and was and is God. Pribble accepts that Jesus was with God, but obviously rejects the fact that he was and is God. Pribble further dodges the import of the text when he wrote that Jesus is not God in what he says is the absolute sin. Where does Pribble get the idea from the text? What words would John have to have used to convince Pribble that Jesus is God? Probably no words would convince him of such because Pribble sees everything through his own broken and opaque lenses of his preconceived Priblolian uh, creed. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This causes Pribble some problems. In fact, I would describe them as ungetoverable problems. And it reveals again his infatuation for liberal translations and study Bibles. Pribble, in chapter 21 of his book, flees to these liberal translations and study Bibles in an effort to prove that the reference is to God and to Christ, actually, to God's glory, and in addition, to God's glory, to Christ. He does not accept the fact that here's a reference to Christ as God, and clearly that the one who is coming and the one for whom we are looking is Jesus. He is God. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1, I charge thee in the sight of God, 
and of Christ Jesus, who shall judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. Pribble on page 89 of the book said, Surely no one would deny that God could have been capable of producing a divine offspring from his own substance in the form of a divine son to be his only divine companion from the ages of eternity. And to deny such a possibility would be to deny the omnipotence of God. But I would say to Pribble, no one denies the capability of God to do such. But Pribble cannot prove that this is what God did. With those thoughts in mind, let's look one more time at John 8, verse 58, and we'll bring this lesson to a close. Jesus said in that place, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was born, I am. Recall, as we discussed this earlier, that in this passage, Pribble conjectures that Jesus is only referring to the fact that his existence predates the existence of Abraham. In spite of Pribble's view, the passage before us, John 8, verse 58, is a clear declaration of Christ's eternality. So the guy in Woods wrote on this passage, the verbs here are quite significant. That with reference to Abraham signifies to begin, to come to be, those verbs that refer to Christ means to be evermore existing. There was a point in history when Abraham came into existence. Before this, he was not. But of Christ, it is affirmed that he has always existed. The tense is timeless present, as it stands unlike Abraham who came to be. The Lord is uncreated. The Lord is absolute. The Lord is eternal, always existing, and thus wholly independent of time. Surely Pribble's claim, nowhere does the scripture teach that Jesus as a person had no beginning, is false. He had a beginning in human form, but the second person of the Godhead is eternal and has no beginning. These 308 pages of his book are filled with more error than any volume that I have ever read. Pribble has attacked on virtually every page of the book the very concept and the being of God. He has attempted to belittle our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. 1 Timothy 6, verse 15. Jesus is the one in whom dwelleth all the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2, verse 9. Jesus is the one who was accurately proclaimed by the Apostle Thomas, my Lord and my God. I believe with all of these books that we'll review this week, we need to compare those things that are written by men to that which has been written by God and accept what God has said and reject these men when they differ with what God has written. But there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. When we become Christians, we have to believe in who Jesus is. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus is the one who came as God, in human form, to suffer and die upon the cross for the sake of our salvation. We must believe in him. And believing in him, we must be obedient to his word, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in him before men, and being baptized.
for the remission of sin. If you're here this morning, you need to believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. You need to accept his deity. And because of your belief in him, you need to be obedient to his word. If we can help you in your obedience to Christ this morning, we ask you to come.